Hi guys, welcome back for episode number 48 of the weekly playback. We are almost to number 50, which is half of 100, so that is pretty cool. Um, so I actually did get to play a number of games in the last week. A number of them I actually don't have in my possession, but I'll still talk about them. But before we begin, yesterday was the first day of autumn and it actually ended up feeling like the first day of autumn yesterday too. Oh, Dobby just sneezed. Um, so yeah, so my heat is on today. Hopefully it won't come on, but if it does, I apologize. I know it's crazy because just last week, I think I had the air conditioning on still. Anyway, so the first game I'll talk about, which is the most recent game I played, which was last night. And I think the game went until like 11 p.m. because we started it pretty late. That is Mobile Market's Smartphone Inc. game. So this is a 2021 game. It is for one to four players, designed by Ivan Lachine, and the artist is Victor Miller Gausa, and the publisher is Arcane Wonders. Um, <coughs> so if you, I don't know if you have ever played Smartphone Inc. from Arcane Wonders as well. That's like a big box game. So I think that this is most meant to be like a more, I mean, I could be wrong because I actually never, played smartphone ink <laughs> but I think that this is meant to be a more like streamlined version of that so it's an economic game with like an action cue and like it's got like programming in it so I'll you know throw up some pictures hopefully but in this game you basically will have like these like little cardboard thingies that have different icons on them and you are going to you know everyone will do this simultaneously decide at the beginning of each round and there are five rounds in the game what icons like how many of them you want for that round because different icons will allow you to do different things so it's uh going to let me just see if i can pull up a picture because otherwise it'll be a bit hard to remember the exact order of everything um so yeah so first you have your planning phase where you will plan out what you're going to do in that round with those two cardboard things that I mentioned. So they're both double-sided. All the players have the same exact two. You can cover up, you have to cover up at least one space of one tile with another. Um, you can't cover up one tire, tile completely with the other. Um, so, you know, you can mix and match and there's, you know, again, two sides. So, you know, depending on what you program you can you know sometimes maybe produce more phones or have a higher priced phone or a lower priced phone like or you can spend more on technology because you have more of the technology icons or more on marketing so you're going to plan what you want to do in that round after everyone has planned then you go to pricing so everyone's going to look at what their price of the phone is for that round and if you have any price minus icons then you'll subtract for the base from the base price which is always going to be five starting at five or if you have any plus icons you'll add on and in addition to all of this there's going to be an event card each round which could affect different things throughout the round um, a different thing in each round then you will go to technology so starting with the person with the lowest priced phone they will then get to decide what they want to purchase from the technology market and it does not get replenished until the end of the round before the next round so you know you may want to buy some kind of technology which you can then upgrade your phone with because certain customers will want different kinds of technology in their phone then you have so after everyone has purchased the amount you know the technologies that they want and those cards they stay with you from round to round so once you purchase them you have them and you can for that round if the phone you're manufacturing you can choose which technologies you want to use in that round um, so, but they always stay in your supply once you buy them. Then there is marketing and a, a start, you start with the highest priced phone and go in reverse for marketing to choose who's going to grab marketing cards first and they'll allow you certain kinds of bonuses, maybe like a game end bonus, or maybe I think technology had game end ones. Marketing might allow you to get some extra customers, like some private customers. If you don't take anything from marketing, for each megaphone icon you have, that you programmed in the beginning, that you planned for in the beginning, you can take that many customers um, for your own private customer pool. Because otherwise there's going to be customers below the whole like production kind of line thing. And those are the customers that you'll be um, selling to otherwise, but you can get your own private customers and you always try to sell to your private customers first. Then you go to the actual production part where you now determine how many phones you are going to be selling, which will be based on the production icons that you have showing, plus if there's any additional ones from the event card. 
and then you will also at this point kind of determine what your profit will be for each phone so you are going to um you you will mark it on your board but at the you'll calculate it at the end after you've completed your sales but your phone has a price and then you're going to have a certain cost for that phone there's always going to be a minus one cost just regardless then if you added certain technologies that have a cost you would subtract that as well from the price of each phone then if you had three technologies you'll also have to subtract an additional one for having three upgrades to your phone so you will determine what your profit will be for each phone and mark it with a cube and you're going to also mark with a cube how many phones you have available for sale and then you go to selling again starting with the lowest priced phone first and you sell to any private customers you have first that you're able to sell to and then you start with the lowest uh, end starting with like the green cards moving over to the blue then the pink which are the people who have the highest amount of money to spend um, the ones with the lowest amount of money um, so obviously you know it's going to be harder to sell to them unless you you know so those people they have less money but they also are willing to like take out a loan or something if a phone has like a certain technology that they really want so if you have the certain technology that they want you can still sell to them even if the price of your phone is higher than they actually have available on their um, customer card so then you sell then you calculate any profits that you've made plus you also determine who sold the most number of phones because they'll also get a set amount of money and then you uh, you know if you have any specific things that you met in your marketing cards you can also calculate that at that point and then just just upgrade the um, the scores the mark the profit and then you continue to the next round and you do that for five rounds so my brain was having a hard I really you know I thought it was a really cool game my brain was having a hard time like figuring out what to do in the beginning like in the beginning I was like you know unsure whether I wanted a lower priced phone or a higher priced phone like should I be investing in technologies like I was really trying to figure out in the beginning like what I'm supposed to be doing and my brain maybe because it was really late at night and we had already played two games prior to this one I was just kind of my brain was just a little bit fried so I was just having a little bit of a difficult time <laughs> figuring out like okay what is profit what is this what is that what is the cost um but you know I figured it out in the end and in the end I actually ended up winning so my my strategy was to invest in a lot of technologies and in the last round um I had a bunch of different technology cards I had some king mend bonuses that you know I was able to get from having a lot of technology as well and in the last round I went for a like a kind of like a medium to high priced phone I think my price the price of my phone in the end was seven and I think I only had seven phones to sell in the end but you know I tried to you know I made sure to get a couple of private customers first um, from not buying a marketing item in the end because you know again if you don't buy a marketing item you can take some customers instead just draw them from the deck um, you don't know what you're getting but you know if you have all the technologies then you you'll probably get something that you can sell to someone that you can sell to so yeah it was a cool game I'm not a fan of the theme like cell phones like selling cell phones like I think it's just kind of a dry theme I think the artwork is just really boring to be honest but the game itself was good I like the action programming um and then you know doing the same thing every round so that you get a you know a really good feel of the game um, it's not one of those games where you know you're going to have your own path to victory and like you know every what you do is totally up in the air no it's like you know you're doing the same exact thing every single round so you get a good feel for the game you can get a good sense of how to start you know programming towards the middle and the end of the game um, if you're a bit slow like me <laughs> so, so yeah so I, I thought it was a really good game I just don't like the theme at all um, I just think it's really a boring theme but you know maybe if the artwork were cute I might have liked it like cute cell phone artwork with cute customers like maybe if they made it like you know selling to like animals I don't know it's just the artwork just does not appeal to me and the theme does not appeal to me but it is a really good game so I played a three-player game of it and again um, you know it was a pretty close uh, game throughout the whole game and towards the end it's it's when I just kind of like went away with a victory like not that far but you know it's like I hardly ever win games so when I do win I just have to kind of really really enjoy it so so yeah so I did win in the end which was pretty cool um so yeah so that was the first well actually that was the last game I played but the first one that I talked about so mobile markets um 
So let's move on. The next game I'll talk about is Bird Watcher. So this is a game I had covered for its Kickstarter. This is designed by Zakir Jaffrey and the art is by Lauren Helton. It's published by Renegade Games and Oni Press Games and it is for one, two, five players. And this just came out this year. Um, so I'm such an idiot. So I remember when I showed you guys um, when I received my production copy, production copy of this like a couple of weeks ago and I showed it to you. I'm so dumb because I was like, oh wow, like look, the front side tells you what actions you can take and the back side shows you how to score. Um, I totally did not realize that this opens up so that you can actually have a proper tree. Um, yeah, so the same friend who um, came to my rescue when we were playing the transcontinental because I thought a bunch of my pieces were like I thought I was missing a bunch of components because I couldn't find something and he just flipped over some components and was like oh they're on the other side he's the same friend who opened this up and was like oh you know this opens up and makes a tree so thank you know goodness for him because otherwise I was like oh like okay the tree kind of looks funny but it's cool that on one side you have your actions on the other side you have your scoring but no it actually opens up to form a tree so this is a set collection game and you are going to have like a certain number of birds in the jungle three and there's going to be certain publication cards in the academy and then you have a clearing which can have up to four different piles of birds and you can have up to six birds in your tree and then on the bottom of your tree is your book that you are going to be publishing. So it's a set collection game. So on your turn, you can do one of these things. And I like how thematic this game is and how it really, the actions tie into the theme. So you can take a photo. If you take a picture of a bird from your tree, it's going to startle one bird from your tree into the clearing. So when you startle a bird, you're going to put it sideways to indicate it's startled because you can't collect startled birds. So if you take a photo, you're going to put it in your photo journal underneath your tree and the game end will trigger once uh, you've reached someone has reached the requisite number of pages in their journal and that can include photos of birds and it will also include publication cards and publication cards are just ways for you to get extra points so the birds themselves will give you points and then the publication cards will give you points um, so if you choose to get some which is an action in itself so let me just show you some examples of publication cards so like here are publication cards so like, and once you put something in your journal, you cannot move it unless you have a publication card that allows you to do that, or maybe a special tool, because if you can play with tools as well, so there are these tool cards and each person will get dealt two tool cards in the beginning and you will pick one and you can use your tool once per game. So you might be able to move pages around in a journal that way as well. Um, so yeah, so you can take a photo which will startle a bird and then move one bird to the clearing. So you always have to have one bird to move in, in addition to the one that you want to put in your photo journal. You can um, run into the jungle. If you run into the jungle, it's going to move all the birds from the jungle here, all three of them into the clearing. And if there's an open space in the clearing, again, there's four piles, then you have to put one in the open space first before you decide how to put the other ones in. And if there's a startled bird and you're covering up a startled bird, the, star the startled one will no longer be startled. You can um, do a bird call. Doing a bird call means you take all birds of one type from both the jungle and the clearing. So that's why you might want to run into the jungle before doing a bird call because it will reveal new cards in the jungle and you might be able to collect more birds. Then you can do a zoom lens action, which takes two action points. So you get three action points per turn, typically, unless you know you turn into insect tokens and I'll get to that in a minute. So zoom lens, it costs two actions. You can take a bird from another player's tree and add it to your photo journal but then you have to take a bird from your tree and move it to their tree. And additionally, they also get to draw one bird from the bird deck and you can publish, which also takes two actions. So you can take a card from the Academy and add it to your journal immediately. Um, and so certain cards, when you add them to your journal, birds, uh, some of them have insect tokens on them. And so those will also give you set collection points in the end. So some birds, uh, they will just score individually, um, you know, just the value of the points that are on them. 
other birds you need to put adjacent to each other in your photo journal so once you put something in your photo journal you cannot move it it's really important and if you had three of these birds next to each other you would get 14 points whereas if you had just one you would get four points so it's a pretty cool set collection game i really like it i've you know never played wingspan so this is like my bird game <laughs> so so yeah so this is the bird game i've played and i really enjoy it i think it's a really nice game with beautiful stunning artwork i just really really love it um and I think that's it. The tools were actually like a little mini expansion. Um, I don't believe that they came with the base game. So I think, I don't know if they do or not. Um, and in this one, if you backed it on Kickstarter and you backed the deluxe edition, then you would get these tokens, these insect tokens in the, wood, the wooden ones. I have not played this solo yet, um, but I do hope to at some point. And I just want to, um, talk about scoring. So yeah, so in scoring, you're first going to score for your sets of birds, then publication, any points you get from any publication cards you have. Then if you have the most sickle bill birds, which are some of the birds that only give you just one, like, these are sickle bills, sickle bills, sickle bills. If you have the most of those, you'll get seven. Otherwise, the second most, you'll get three. If you have the greatest variety of birds, you'll get seven points, otherwise three. And then you'll get points for insect sets of insect tokens. And then if you have the most books, you'll get five. If you have the least amount of books, you'll get minus two points. And then whoever has the most points will win. So yeah, it's a pretty cool set collection game. I really like, you know, like being able to like run into the jungle and like move birds to the clearing and, you know, the whole idea of certain birds being startled. And it's just got really pretty cool, like tropical like birds in, the, in this game. So it's a really pretty nice set collection game. I'm going to try to teach this one to my mom. So yeah, so if you're looking for like a nice, like kind of relaxing set collection game, highly recommend Bird Watcher. So yeah, do check this one out. I've only ever played this at two players. When I had the um, prototype version of this to cover for Kickstarter, I only played it at two players. And then last night I played this at two players. So I really do want to play it at a higher player account. And I definitely want to try it solo. Uh, the next game I will talk about is one that I had to send off, but that I did cover for its Kickstarter, so you will see a video of it soon. It's called Skull. So this is a dice stacking game, which is hitting Kickstarter in October, so next month. It's designed by Andrew Prowse, and it's uh, the art is done by Jeanette Ramos and uh i guess it's going to be self-published maybe it's for one to six players uh i only played like a two no yeah a two player game of this so in skull you are you each have um a Nordic god. So you each have a Nordic god that you are playing as and you each person has a cup. It's a dice stacking game. So if you are the active player, you are going to either first be able to, uh, you know, you'll see the video for this when I post it, but um, you'll get to announce a special, um, what's the word? restriction uh, challenge challenge you'll be able to announce a certain challenge that you will have for that round and that everyone will have to go by but additionally based on who you are each person has a special power so based on your special power and of course if I remember correctly I, I Heimdall was purple and that's why I chose Heimdall so you will also get to use your own special power so when you invoke a challenge, your special power might be allowing you to not have to do the challenge like everyone else. So then the active player is going to reveal a card and then as quickly as possible, you're just trying to create some kind of a dice structure. And then the first person to get to the requisite number of points will win. So it's just like a fun dice stacking game. I don't know if you guys have ever played this one game called kittens or something like that it's a uh, it's an alley cat games where you're stacking up cats so it reminded me a little bit of that even though this one has dice in it because you know you're trying to quickly stack something it's like kind of like a dexterity game in a way because you know your dice can topple over you have to be careful about stacking them and making certain kinds of structures it's not meant to be a strategy game it's meant to be like a fun party like stacking game and that's what it is um so you know if that's what you're looking for. If you're looking for a game that can be fun, a good filler game that is, you know, just has a bit of dexterity involved, then this is the game for you. Um, also, I will um, mention that it can be played as a drinking game. Of course, I didn't do that because I don't drink, but it comes with cups and the rule book does mention that you can kind of come up with your own rules to make it a drinking game. So 
you know, for people who do drink, maybe you can make it even more fun than it already is. So yeah, so that's going to be hitting Kickstarter next month. Unfortunately, I don't have it to show you right now because I had to send it on to another reviewer. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't play it enough in time to show you in a weekly playback video, but um, you'll see my one minute video for it. Okay, moving on. A lot of games this week. Okay, so the next game I will talk about is Thief of Baghdad, which is another game I don't have to show you right now. And this game, actually, they changed the name of it, um, I learned. So this is published by Queen Games, but let me just bring it up. Baghdad. Do, 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 do. So yeah, the name was changed to 12 Thieves, apparently. I don't know why they changed it from the Thief of Baghdad to 12 Thieves, but they did. Um, so the designer is Thorsten Gimler and the artist are listed, the artists are listed as Patricia, Patricia Limberger and Michael Menzel and it's published by Queen Games and it's for two to four players. In this game, you are basically going to have a market board um, and in each section, there are, I think, six sections in total, if I remember correctly, yeah. So there is yellow, like aqua, like blue, white, green, purple, and red, or maybe orange. It's hard to tell what color it's supposed to be. And in each section, um, there is room for four guards. You are basically going to have, I believe, four guards in your possession, and then 12 thieves in total. And there's going to be a certain number of treasures in each location, starting with a smaller number of thief requirement, increasing in the thief requirement to grab a treasure. Treasures themselves are not worth a different amount of points, but the earlier on you can get a treasure, it's better because it'll require fewer thieves for you to get it. So what you can do on your turn, you will start the game with a certain number of cards in hands. Cards basically just show you a different color location. So what you can do is you can place a guard in a certain location. You can move a guard and one thief from one location to another. You can move a neutral colored guard, which will take two cards. It'll take the color card of the location you're moving it from plus the color of the location you are moving it to whereas if you are only moving your own guard you only need one color you need either the color you're moving from or the color you're moving into um, so if you want to steal something you need again a certain number of thieves the starting number in each location is going to be four and then it goes up to two a total of seven so you'll have and you can only you can't like you know you'll always start with the stack on the number on top and then go at, so it'll just progressively get harder you can't like go through the stack if you manage to get like seven thieves in a location you can't like just go to the bottom to take the treasure that has seven people on it no um so yeah so you are just basically trying to put thieves into a location in order to get the treasures and then the first person to the requisite number of treasures will win um there are also dancer cards so instead of taking a turn you can just pass and draw three cards like you would at the end of a normal turn doesn't matter how many cards you spent you always just only get to draw three at the end but if you pass you get to draw three cards plus take a neutral dancer card which can be used as a wild a wild dancer card um, so yeah, but if you want to steal something, there has to be at least one other guard of another color in that location because otherwise they'll know it's you who stole something. So it's better for you, I actually I don't know if it really makes a difference, but you can move neutral guards, but you cannot move guards of someone else, obviously. Um, but you do need other guards in a location to steal something. And for each other guard that is not your color, you need to put down one color card for each thief you want to put there. So like, let's suppose there are two guards, two neutral guards in a location plus me, my guard, and I want to put down some thieves. I would have to, if I want to put down two thieves, I would need to put down two cards per thief since there are two guards there. So that would be a total of four cards for me to put down two thieves in that location. Uh, this game is cool because when you move a guard, you can always move one thief along with it. If you collect a treasure, you take back all of your thieves and they go back to your supply. So it can happen where you start to get lower on thieves and you start to need to st start strategizing about moving guards and thieves in order to steal something. And your opponent is also going to be trying to mess you up by adding more and more guards into your location potentially. So that happened to me. I was very clearly winning and then my opponent saw that I was trying, he could 
child and I was trying to get a treasure from a certain location based on how many thieves I had started putting into a certain location. So he added more guards into that location and unfortunately I just did not get the cards I needed to really effectively get my last treasure. So he got his last treasure just before I would have been able to get my last treasure in order to win this, this game. Very simple mechanics. It's just really cool though, like how you just have cards with just colors on them and you're just moving things around and that's the whole game. So it's very simple but you know still pretty fun and strategic. So this is an older game. I can't remember when the original version came out. But let me see if it'll show me. Uh, the original version came out in 2006 and the it was renamed uh, the 12 Thieves in... T well, actually I don't know when they redid that. It still shows 2006 on Board Game Geek so I don't know. So yeah so that is from Queen Games and I don't know if the new edition like if they've like upgraded it or something. I can't imagine how you would deluxify this because it's literally just a bunch of meeples and a board and cards. Like there's really not much else to it. So yeah, so that is The Thief of Baghdad. The next game I will talk about is a game that I haven't talked about before. I don't think I have. So I'll talk about this one first. It's called Masquerade. Um, so Masquerade is a social deduction game. That came out in 2013. It's not spelled with a Q, it's actually spelled with a C. Um, and it's for 2 to 13 players, designed by Bruno Fiducci. The artist is Jeremy Masson, and it's published by Repos Production, I guess. Um, I did not like this game. <laughs> we played three, I've played it before as well, and we played three games of it at game night this past week. I just, I just don't like it. Um, in this game, each player is going to be dealt face up a card that, you know, has their identity on it. And then after everyone goes around in a circle, like whatever, saying who they are, then you turn all the cards upside down. Then on your turn, you can, so you are trying to get to 16 coins first. Or no, 13 coins, my bad. You're trying to get to 13 coins first in order to win. Different identities allow you to do different things. And you can swap cards. So on your turn, you can either... Um, look at your card and that can be your action or you can swap cards with someone so if you take a card from someone you can go under the table you can know whether you are actually swapping or not um, so you know you'll know which card you picked up and which card is yours and then you'll return one to the person you swapped it you know swapped with and then you'll take your card back and put them face down so that can be an action in itself or you can try to claim to be something and do the action that is allowed by that character and then if someone else says no actually I think I'm that thing then you both reveal your cards if your card was revealed just before it was your turn then you cannot take the action where you say I am this and I want to do whatever because it'll be very recent in your memory what you are so you can't do that. I just don't like this game. I just really really don't like it. It's just I just don't think it's fun in terms of social deduction games like it's just see one of those games where you just have to have a really good memory I feel like and there's just too much unknown like just too much of swapping and stuff like that happening. It's just too much chaos. It just doesn't seem to have really any strategy. I just I just don't like it and we played three games of it which was kind of torture for me but you know the rest of the group wanted to play it. We played at six and seven players I think but yeah in terms of social deduction and bluffing games I think that there are just better games out there that do this much better you know so so yeah I won't go into much more about it but yeah did not enjoy it. <laughs> okay so uh, the next game we'll talk about is one that I have talked about before so this was my second time playing it. It is called Illumination. So Illumination is designed by Elf Siegert, and I don't know who does the artwork, so let me just pull it up. Um, and this is published by Eagle Griffin Games, and this is a two-player only game. Illumination. Okay, where are you? Doo -doo 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 -doo. So yeah, this is a 2021 game. And the art is done by Claire Campen and Jake Thomas Show. And yeah, 2021 published by Eagle Griffins and it's only for one to two players. So uh, you are basically going to have a manuscript and you are filling in the icons in this manuscript. So you are going to have one page look like this, one page in the center, and then another page with its borders like this or like this. So it's gonna look like something like that and you can see that there's text and different feathers. So on your own board, you are going to have, um, 
So there's two different colors, there's black and white. You are going to have certain tiles and you are going to be taking off tiles in a certain way so you can only take them from a column or a row and you're going to have stacks of tiles and when you reveal a new stack to put down you can't change their order because it's very important how you pick them up because that determines which books they can go into which pages so you always have to go from book from page one two and three so you'll put the tile originally in the margin but you might have a special action that may allow you to actually place the tile in the adjacent page instead of the page you want to place it in if you place it adjacent to a tile of the same color then you will um, be able to get a ritual token of that color there are a bunch of ritual tokens and i'll explain what they do in a minute if you place it on a matching flag so you place a red tile not flag sorry feather on a red feather you will get to take a coin you can at the end of your turn you can't have more than the number of spaces shown on your board which is one two three four five six seven so at the end of your turn you can have no more than seven coins or ritual tokens this one just shows what you start with so this person at the beginning of the game starts with five coins because they're the second player to go whereas the first place player starts with just one coin and you have your own supply of coins that you're just going to be using throughout the game so on your turn you're going to take one of the uh, sets of tiles and depending which set you want and then place it on the margins of the book and then you're going to try to place it in the book and you're trying to do this strategically because you are going to be engaging in battles so there are going to be tiles with different kinds of icons on them so all the tiles have these different icons and these are the ones that battle each other so you have angels battling demons you have knights battling dragons you have monks battling rabbits don't understand and you have dogs battling squirrels which makes sense so a battle happens once a um once those icons are completely enclosed by either the border of the book by text or by other icons that will not engage in that battle. Once they are completely bound, it's called a bounded battle and you will immediately engage in a battle and the person who has the most icons winning will flip over all the other person's icons and as a consolation prize, the person who had their tiles flipped over will get one coin per tile that was flipped over. Um, and yeah, and coins will allow you to do different things. So coins, um, so on your turn, you know, you're going to be placing tiles. You can use a coin to move a tile from a book's margin to a book away per coin spent. So that's how you can place tiles in other books. You can move the abbot pawn. So in the monastery, you're going to have an abbot that is going to be moving around and there are these spaces between these colored spaces as well and in order to turn in ritual tokens you need to have the abbot on the color that you want to turn in ritual tokens for and you will get a certain number of points at the end of the game based on how many tokens you spent and you will put a cube on there and once you do that no one else can turn in that amount of ritual tokens to get that number of points at the end um, you can also spend two coins to draw a scriptorium card. Each player has a certain, uh, has their own deck of scriptorium cards, which will allow you to do special actions. Uh, and you basically will take as many turns as you are able to, as many actions, pardon me, as you are able to before the turn passes to the next player. And you go back and forth like this until the game end is triggered, meaning that no one else can take a turn, like there's nowhere else to place anything on this book. And then basically you're just going to see who has the most points at the end. So you're going to get points for each tile of yours that is faced up. Um, in addition, you'll get points for whoever won the most battles of a certain kind. So you, every time you win a battle, there's going to be battle cards and you will place a cube on that battle card to indicate that you won that battle. And then whoever has the most points on a certain battle card, most cubes on a certain battle card will get five points at the end for that. Each person has their own crusade card. So in addition, you uh, at the beginning of the game, you will be randomly dealt a crusade card, which will indicate which battles, which uh, tiles of the other person you are trying to flip over. And if you manage to flip over um, a certain number of their tiles, you will get a certain number of points. So for me, I was trying to flip over a bunch of squirrels and I did. So I was able to get 10 points at the end because I managed to flip over at least like four of their squirrels. 
Um, so yeah, so that like kind of works in conjunction with the battles because, you know, your crusade card is going to show an icon that belongs to the other person's tiles and which you'll be engaging in battles with. So you will, you know, it'll kind of help you to determine which battles you really want to try to focus on. Although, you know, the game I played of this, I feel like the battles were not happily happening as frequently like we were just kind of creating these like really big zones like it took a while to get them bounded and for battles to actually happen this so that is the gist of the game it's a two-player game again and it is a really good two-player game and i feel like it just does not get a lot of attention and i just don't understand why like i mean to be honest i had no idea what this game was until i requested a review copy of it it just seemed really cool i just remember i went on the website for eagle griffin one day and i saw this and i saw um, the Road to Canterbury, designed by the same designer, and I was like, these look really awesome and I want to play them. And I think this designer, I feel like he's a very, his games are quirky, but super cool, and I just really, really love them. I also really enjoyed The Road to Canterbury, which is a two to three player game. So yeah, if you're looking for a really good two player game, highly recommend Illumination from Eagle Griffin Games. So that was another game I got to play again. Another game I played recently again is Paris, La Cité de Lumière, which is also another two-player game. Um, I won't open this up, but the box of course turns into the board and you're taking turns on your turn either you know, drafting um, certain buildings, which you'll be putting on down in the second phase of the game, or you're putting down your own cobblestone tiles. It's a really good two-player game. I've talked about it before, so I won't go into detail again, but the expansion is highly recommended in my opinion. Um, I would I would highly recommend it, I guess, um, because you can mix and match cards, scoring cards from both games. And so, you know, it's a really great expansion. Unfortunately, not everything fits into one box. Oh, you know, it'd be great if the came out with a big box edition of this that would be really awesome with like really nice components oh my god this would be such a cool game to deluxify if they came out with acrylic cobblestone tiles and like really nice pieces and like really nice building pieces and really nice like instead of cardboard pieces like like a nice eiffel tower to put down and a nice arc de triumph this would be such a good game to deluxify they should totally do that because it is a really good two-player game and deluxified oh my god i can just imagine how gorgeous it would look oh my god okay i'm totally gonna write to devere games and give that idea to them if they haven't already thought about that yeah so if you're a fan of this game like i am yeah i think we should like really petition for them to deluxify this um, because I would totally buy it like I love this game so freaking much and yeah I would totally totally invest in a deluxified edition of this game yeah um, so yeah but this is from Devere Games um, I don't remember I guess I can tell you the information since I haven't done that yet <laughs> um, Paris la Cité de la Lumière and I know my French sucks because I don't speak French so yeah it, the base game came out in 2019 and it's designed by Jose Antonio Abascal Acebo quite the name and the art is done by Oriol Hernandez and again published by De Beer for two players oh, but I seriously love this game now I really want a deluxe version of it with like really nice acrylic tiles I think that would look so freaking amazing okay yeah so I really hope they do that okay um, and the last game I will talk about that I've played before and quite frankly it's the only cooperative word game and quite frankly the only word game that I really really love so Clover just have a freaking blast every time I play this game it is just so much fun um, I've talked about it before but let me just read you the basic information so Clover so Clover so this came out in 2021 it is designed by Francois Romain published by Repos Production um, it's like two day two games today made by repos production and i'd never heard of them before today <laughs> so yeah um and uh it's for three to six players so this is a cooperative word game in which each player is going to have a clover and you are just going to randomly select four of these cards the only thing is that it can be hard to write on this secretly because these can fall out easily um but you are basically just going to randomly put in these tiles these cards and then you have to come up with a word that basically links the two words on each side. After you've done that, after you've written down your word, you remove these, you shuffle in an extra card randomly, and then the players, the rest of the players, have to try to guess where the cards fit into this with the 
decoy one mixed in. It's so much fun. They get basically two chances to try to get the correct placement of these. If you play with friends, I feel like it's a lot of fun because you can try to guess how a person might have like th been thinking like based on who they are and their personality. I get so into this game. I just really, really have a blast every time I play it. So I would say it's my favorite word game. Like it totally surpasses like code names or just one or any other word game for me. Like this is the word game that I will always go for. I just absolutely have a blast playing it every single time. So yeah, so played like two or three games of that. So that was a lot of fun. So I think I did it. I think I made it through all the games I've played. So let's move on. So I'm actually backing something. I just came across this game called Weavelings in the Wilds, a puzzly solo card game of meat, murder, and weight gain. Um, to be honest, I didn't actually pay attention to how it's played. All I saw is that it's a puzzly solo game and um, I guess one guy, reviewer from the Dice Tower, said he enjoyed it. I think I saw that on the campaign page. Did not really pay attention to how it's played, but the artwork is just really interesting. It's very unique artwork. Um, so quite frankly, that's why I'm backing it because it's a solo game with a unique artwork, artwork and it's like $20 for the base game with the two expansions it'll come with plus shipping I believe and shipping seems to be cheap like they already I believe listed the shipping cost as well. So that I am backing and again no idea how it really plays but whatever I don't really I, you know it doesn't matter it's like a cheap solo game and it's got cool artwork so yeah so I'm backing that. <laughs> um, moving on um, games oh I again did not bring it here but I'll be covering it soon the <laughs> games I received so Heisen hyper Hyperspace but I yet again forgot to put it on my table here but next week or I'll show it to you guys sometime or after I play Heist in Hyperspace. Um, but yeah I haven't received any other games. I actually did place an order on Board of Game Bliss just yesterday. I placed an order for the expansion to Picture Perfect to make it a five to six player game and then I also placed an order for uh well I guess I'll show you the rest of the things that I ordered when they come in. I only it was a small order like cheap like relatively cheap stuff um so when that comes in I'll show that to you guys. Um, so let's move on to questions and commentary. I didn't get any questions, but I have one for you and that is based on my discussion of mobile markets earlier. So my question for you is, is there a game that you like the mechanics and gameplay of but hate the theme? Could the theme be changed to something else? And if you could change it, what would you change it to? I can think of a couple games like this, mobile markets being one, like I would definitely change the theme to something else. Um, you know, me and my friends were discussing this last night and they were under the impression that you could only really change it to something that has to do with technology that can be like upgraded. But I personally think you could make it anything like chocolate. So I imagine you could have a chocolate production line in chocolate connoisseurs because I absolutely love chocolate and you can have like different kinds of chocolates and like you can upgrade them with different kinds of fillings and different toppings. Um, what else could you do? Yeah marketing is important so you'll be trying to also technologies will be different fillings that you're trying to acquire. Yeah so you can totally make a game about chocolate instead of having it be about cell phones and I think it would have been a much better like selling game because who the hell doesn't love chocolate right and it would have been so good to look at like just amazing chocolatey pieces like cards with chocolate on them like oh my god I think that would have been amazing so yeah I would have totally changed mobile markets to a chocolate production game of course I know that there actually exists a game like that already called chocolate factory but it's not entirely the same so I think you could still do it so and also as an attorney, um, you know, I, I have taken a personal interest in this, whether mechanics are patentable and they are not. So really, you actually could copy a game and just change the theme completely and publish it. And as long as you're not copying, you know, the name of it, then too bad, really. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, you know, people might hate you for doing that because like you kind of ripped off of someone else's work, but it's not illegal. Like you can actually do that. <laughs> so, and I know people do that all the time. Like people just re, you know, retheme games all the time. Like it's something that people do. Like no game is going to be entirely a hundred percent unique. You're not going to 
have a game that I think is just so unique that it didn't borrow anything from any other game. Because, you know, I think games are just always building upon mechanics and, you know, different combinations of mechanics from other games. There is another game I can think of where I would change the theme, but I might actually want to do that myself someday. So I'm not going to say which game it is and what I would change about it, but it's not my hollow, it's not my um, elephant game. So don't worry about that. Um, but there is a game that I do think I would love to reskin it someday with something else that I am you know, passionate and in love with and publish it someday. So I might actually try to do that. So I'm not going to reveal what it is, but if there's a game that you love the theme and uh, the, the, not the theme, the mechanics and gameplay of, but you aren't a fan of the theme, like what would you reskin it as or retheme it as? I would seriously love to know if you have any games in mind that, you know, you would do that too. So I guess that is it. Um, I was not feeling as stressed out today because my table was already a bit clear today since I've been trying to be a little bit better about packing. As you can see, spaces are really starting to empty out now and I'm just getting so excited to move. But yes, I will shut up about that now. Um, so I'm still waiting for my Flamecraft game. Oh my God, people have been getting their Flamecraft game and I know I have the prototype version of it, but I just really cannot wait to see my production copy of it. But I still haven't gotten a shipping notification for it. It's like killing me and I know I have so many games on my shelf of shame that I could play but you know it's like it's kind of like the FOMO that I'm suffering from right now because I keep on seeing people unboxing their production copies of Flamecraft and I just cannot wait to see my copy of that game so but I haven't even gotten a shipping notification for it yet but yeah so uh, I guess that's it for this week so I guess until next week guys bye